Well, hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, here we are again uh, for another Cars and Coffee. And if you're a car guy that wants to learn uh, about uh, tech and all kinds of things car, uh, you're in the right spot. Over uh, the next hour or so, we're going to spend some time going over the subject for today, which is going to be chassis support. Oh, I'm Kenny Brown, and, and this is Cars and Coffee. And uh, Again, we're going to answer some questions that came in from the Speed Therapy Society. And please, if you have any questions, be sure to send them in at the end. And the end, we'll kind of, I'll kind of go back and try to answer your questions live and see what I can do about that. So let's see. Today, we're going to talk about uh, this is kind of interesting how this came up. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into this more when we get to the presentation. But uh, uh, power robbing chassis flex in Mustangs. Now, Mustangs are a unibody car. And, you know, when I started working with them in 86, they were flexi flyers is the best way to put it. Unfortunately, we were able to run full, for full cages for SHA Pro Endurance Racing. But for the street, we had to do some interesting things to try to stiffen the chassis. So we'll get into that in a little bit. And that's going to be not only the tech talk, but also be part of show and tell. We'll, we'll show you some of the products and the solutions that I've come up with to combat chassis flex, which it does a number of bad things. Let's see, we've also got some good questions this morning. Uh, and let's see, oh, yeah, YouTube. Like, click, subscribe, bell. I got them all in. And Facebook, uh, be sure to like and then share. You can you can share, start a, a, a share a party or watch party. I think there's some clicks in there. You can just click and invite people and do the watch party. I think the, uh, let's, let's start with a couple of, uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, this is from Greg. Now, what do you do the underside of a car to prevent corrosion? Boy, that's kind of like a that, that's a tough question because the newer car, most of the newer cars, are, are pretty pretty tough underneath. Uh, you know, the the best thing we don't do anything here. Uh, we don't treat underside of the cars because you know it's uh, most of our performance cars are, are not out in the winter that much. But my best recommendation for my street cars, what I do is I run them through the car wash after every snowstorm and I get the under under underside. Uh, so you run through the car wash and get the underwash and that kind of takes off all this, all the salt and stuff. But it's, it's the salt that, uh, that left on there will start to corrode. But I mean, there's, there's, there's products out there. I think you'd have to probably have to talk to somebody that actually does that for a living uh, on what would be the best uh, product to use. But the, my biggest tip is just you know, run through the car wash, get the un, under the under car wash with it. And that kind of takes everything off. Uh, uh, Greg also asked, this is another really good question. Uh, how do I feel about air to air intercoolers versus air to water intercoolers? Uh, the air to air intercooler is, is kind of like the like a turbo, the compressed air, the hot air from the supercharger goes through like a big radiator and comes out the other side cool and goes into the engine. Air to water is within like the intake manifold there's going to be another little heat exchanger and the super hot supercharged air goes through that that pulls the heat out via water and it takes it to the, the heat exchanger in the front of the car and then it puts the cool water back in so there's two different ways of, uh, of cooling the charged air and, it, and you have to cool supercharged or turbocharged air because when you compress air it gets hot and you get too much heat and you start losing losing performance and you know, bad things can happen if you have too much inlet temperature so here's the thing for a, like a positive displacement supercharger. That's something like the Eaton, the Roush, the uh, uh, the Whipple. Any of those positive displacement was a screw type supercharger. Pretty much they're all air to water. That's simply because the, it, the little uh, exchanger packages pretty neatly underneath the supercharger, you know, in the manifold area. Now the uh, centrifugal superchargers like like uh, Vortec, Paxton, or, or Pro Charger, <clears throat> they're kind of like mechanical turbos. It's like a, a turbo compressor driven by a belt off, off the motor. Uh, for that, I prefer prefer air to air, and that's where they you know you just the, the the hot compressed air goes through the the heat exchanger and comes that cool and into the engine. Uh, in in motorsports and racing, that's all we ever use is air to air. Uh, but most of those cars are turbo cars. So for the for the, the track cars that we that do use like a, a, a supercharger, uh, preferably for a Mustang on tracks and typical, I, I prefer much better. Uh, air to air seems to be the best. It's also less complex. There's fewer things to break. 
the more complexity you put into anything, the more opportunity there are for things to break or go wrong. So, I mean, there's two different applications. Uh, certainly, if you're if you're supercharging like a an SUV or a truck pickup truck, you want to use the, the positive displacement, the the Eaton style, and for that, that's air to water. Uh, so, there's you know different applications for each. Let's see. Hirschfer want to know uh, how important is the IRS lockout? Uh, Alignment kiss. I'm not sure what he's talking about. Wonder if I should install such on my cars. This will help. Uh, with my left rear hub issues. Huh? Yeah, Hurst has had some, a, a bunch of hub issues, but I think what he's talking about, and, and we use this, it's actually a kit that the uh, the whole IRS carrier is matted rubber, and it's pretty wiggly. Uh, and so what we what we use is it's just it's a kit, little pieces that slide into the rubber parts and pretty much locks it down so the IRS carrier doesn't move. Uh, I think that's what he's talking about. I mean, I, I would recommend it no matter what. I think you really need to lock the IRS carry down. Uh, I, I don't know if that's going to help the hub situation, but I know that helps the back of the car work better if you, if you lock that down. So that's what I'm guessing he was he was talking about. So that's my that's my my thoughts. Okay, now power robbing chassis. Hey, Penny. Hey, Penny. You uh -huh. there? Yeah, Herstifer has one more question. I'm going to post it here for you. It okay. came late, so see if you can see it. Oh, I posted it in the chat. Here it goes. Um, so when I'm changing gears in the car, I have a very annoying kickback of the car in every gear. Should I be worried, and what may it be? Uh, changing gears. I have an annoying kick, kick in the back of the car. I'm not sure what that means. Whatever it is, it doesn't sound like I'm, I'm not sure what what it means. But if if it's something that happens all the time and the car isn't running smoothly, it's certainly something you should look into. Uh, annoying kick in the back. Not 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 sure what that means. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's if, if you're experiencing it, it's something that shouldn't be there. And if it's something that shouldn't be there, you need to look into it. Um, like I say, I'm not really sure what it is. It might be that the IRS kind of moving around the back. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, def definitely look into it. Okay. So we are going to get into chassis support support this morning and let me go to, I need to move some things around here and Oh, there's the button. Okay, here we go. Chassis support. Now this off started with this uh, picture and and a post that that uh, Ben in the Speed Therapy Academy sent in. We kind of talked about. And what you're looking at is this is this is an SN95 or I can't remember SN95 or Fox, one of those cars that was converted to IRS and a coilover shock system. Now, as you can see here, uh, the the actual shock mount has pulled away from the inner fender pretty severely. Uh, and what he's talking about, uh, I, this is a long post and I kind of chopped it off just so you can see a bit bigger uh, picture. Let's say he was it's, it's throwing it in the trash. He had somebody else's like rear uh, shock tower uh, brace, and he said it was junk. He's going to throw it in the trash. I'm guessing that's the remnants of it here, you know, both of the inner fender. But he says, uh, I'm curious if I got unlucky or maybe it, it's something that could be, there's, there's something that could prevent this from some other folks in the future. <laughs> Actually, there is. And this is it. This is our uh, rear shock tower brace for SN95. And we developed this back when uh, we started converting, well, we started working on uh, the IRS cars in 99 and converting them to coilover. And because we were converting them to coilover, uh, what we did is I wanted all the, all the load, not only the spring, the shock load, but the spring loads went right in here to this, the rear shock mount. And they really weren't designed for that kind of load. They were designed for the, just the load of the shock absorber. So we added the three-point strut tower brace. 
and the whole idea is we kind of capture we it, it, it captures the uh, the shock mount. Uh, the, the shock actually bolts right through the hole in the middle of it, and then there's two bolts on the side that bolt it into uh, the mount itself, so it's pretty secure. And then we've got a third one in the middle, so we actually get some level of triangulation uh, between the two shock, shock towers. And this has made a huge difference. We never have never ever had any kind of issue with uh, with uh, uh, any any kind of issue in pulling away. So let me show you real quick if i can find me oh, there i am carrie's not here so i'm struggling with technical stuff today okay so here's here's what actually looks like in person this is the rear shock tower brace and you can see that we have it so that the shock goes right through and then we also bolt it to the to the uh the shock mount and then there's a, th a third spot in, in the middle so you can see we've got a triangulation and triangulation is the strongest part the strongest uh the strongest engineering fixture so let's go back Uh, hey, Carrie, did that come up? Uh, hey, hey, Carrie? Hey, oh, she's not there. I don't think Brad's there either. Okay, I'm hoping this is working because I can't really tell. Okay, I'm going to have to start over. Oh, this is not one. This is not a good day for me. There we go. There it is. <laughs> Got it back. Okay, so we got the triangulation, and that that's that supports the shock. The other thing that we do that's different than anybody else is the uh, the typical mount for the, the bayonet type shock in the back is, is rubber, uh, either soft or hard. Well, we, because all the load is going into the uh, the rear uh, shock mount, we actually use urethane uh, between the shock and the, and the body so that it, it's no give and stays firm. I mentioned triangulation. This is getting back to my very early days when I started my racing career back in the 70s. Uh, my exposure to chassis strength and rigidity and came from uh, working with Formula Ford space frames. Now you can see there's a whole bunch of triangles and this one's even a little bit better. But triangles the strongest, uh, most rigid engineering uh, structure. And the, all the race cars back then, I mean, they had tons and tons of triangulation. That's what makes them rigid. The more rigid a race car, the better it's going to handle. Uh, the more uh, rigid or, or, or stiffer a streetcar is, A, the better it's going to handle, and B, the better ride quality it's going to have, and C, it takes away rattles and squeaks. So this is what I started. This is what I started learning about uh, chassis and strength back in the 70s. But to take that, and let's put it into like a full-size car, and you can see this is just kind of a, a drawing of, of a, uh, a two-frame race car. And again, there's like triangles everywhere to add strength. But when we get to a production unibody, uh, like all the cars are today, there's there's not much, there's no triangulation, there's not much strength, it's just a bunch of sheet metal pieces that are spot welded together, which is why they have a tendency to flex so much. The early Mustangs really, really flexed really bad. So what we did is I came up with some solutions, like for the three race cars, it was okay because we had full cages, which stiffened up the chassis quite a bit. So <clears throat> what we did do, it was back in 86, <clears throat> you know, the first chassis thing that we did, but even though the, uh, the race cars had a full cage, uh, the first thing we did was uh, put jacking rails on the side, and we're doing, you know, 6, 12, 24-hour races. The cars get jacked up a lot for tire changes, brake changes. So we put a rail that goes right along the pinch wheel. This is actually for an SN95. The Fox is a, is a little bit longer, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. But we came up with a jacking rail so we could jack the car quickly and easily. 
and uh, it would jack, yes, jack one side up at, at once. So after, after the SLEAM program, you know, we brought that uh, into our streetcars because just a you know, lowered, lowered Mustang didn't have to like crawl around the ground uh, trying to look for a place to put your jack. You just put the jacking rail in there and you, know, you just jack the car up. So that was the first thing we did. And the next thing we did is to stiffen up the chassis came a, a little bit later was the double cross subframe connector. Now this is this what this is what here. This connects the front and rear subframes. <clears throat> and what I did, which is called double cross, is we put the bracket in the middle that bolts to the, the back of the seat. Uh, there's already bolts right in the chassis, so it's just a matter of putting a nut on it. And uh, and what that does is reduces the the free span versus captured length. And then also, it's kind of like I don't know if you've ever put a yard yard sign up either for you know a yard sale or or uh, you know political sign. But if you just put a, a piece of cardboard on a stick, it'll just flop all over the place. So that's why you always put a little T in there to keep it from flopping. It would be the same principle here is by putting this T in here that helps strengthen it so it doesn't want to twist. And we had back when we first brought these out, we had one one guy call and said that he thought it was junk because he could put either end on, on a cinder block and stand in the middle and it would bend. Uh, I, I said, yeah, but did you put a cinder block under the under the middle? Uh, and that kind of shut them up. So that, that was the second part that we did to it. And then a little later on, we I, I wanted to add even more strength. So we had the matrix brace, which is pretty unique. A lot of people have copied our jacking rail. A lot of people have copied the double cross subframe connectors. Nobody's really copied the matrix brace so far, which I don't understand because that's that's probably the most important part. But by adding the matrix brace here in the middle, you can see that we add four triangulations, four full triangulations per side. And triangles are the, you know, the strongest uh, engineering structure. And here's a little different view of it. Now, this is actually for, I think, the 99, you know, 96, 98 Cobra, somewhere in there. We actually have to shorten them up a little bit uh, due to the, uh, the transmission mount. Uh, but even so, there's still, the, the, the subframe would be right here, and it still connects four triangulations, uh, connects front and back, uh, cross in the middle so it doesn't flex. I mean, this adds an enormous amount of rigidity to the center of the car. And here's what it kind of looks like under, underneath, all installed. And you can just tell by looking at it that that's, that's real structure. And it doesn't add a ton of weight. <clears throat> Back when we first started doing these, we had like drag racing guys that, that wouldn't want to add these because it added, you know, like 10 pounds or something like that. And you know, just couldn't get through their heads that they're wasting horsepower twisting the body. Uh, when if they, if they strengthen the body, that horsepower goes to the back. But they just uh, didn't think that way. So let me, let me show you a few pieces. Hey, Ken. Yeah. After this, once you connect up again, I'm going to be able to control your screen so they can see you and then I can connect you back to the uh, presentation so you don't have to go through that. OK. OK. Uh, well, let me let me start with the, uh, the Fox uh, jacking rail. This is the identical copy of what we had on the on the 86 Celine cars. And it's it's pretty long. It's like. 59 and a half inches long or something like that. And I try to keep it under the 60, 60 uh, limit for <laughs> UPS, but it's, 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 it's a good piece. I mean, it welds right to the pinch, uh, pinch weld. And back in 86, when we first did this, the SCCA declared this as a illegal chassis stiffening device. <laughs> it made no sense. We had, had a full cage in there. So I actually had to take a hacksaw and put just a little bitty groove two grooves, uh, so it wouldn't be considered a continual piece. In 87, they didn't, even think, didn't mention, mention anything about it. But this is a jacket rail for the Fox. Also, it fits the S197, and it fits Gen 1 Mustangs. But for the SN95, because it's, it's the pinch, pinch wells are a little different, and they've got all these little darts that come through, what we did is we had to do it a little different. I mean, we went to like an inch by inch and a half, and we have these holes on the other side, so little darts that uh, for the holding the body in place slide right into that, and you can weld that up right up there. And it's 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 uh, not quite as long, but equally as efficient. 
The other cool thing about the jacking rails is that uh, once you jack the car up, you can put your jack stands underneath on the jacking rails and a hole underneath the car opens up. And then the, the next thing is going to be the uh, double cross subframe connector, which was the original on the market. And again, you can see that these are these are really nice, strong, uh, high quality pieces. And we, uh, unlike everybody else, <clears throat> we kind of pinch pinch the ends down, so it's not an not an edge. And, and unlike others, there actually is a little bit of a bend front and rear to conform to the body a little bit better. Uh, like I say, every these these have been copied by so many different people. Uh, but this is the original and still the best. And something else I might point out is all our under chassis pieces are uh, silver zinc uh, plated so that for uh, durability and rust protection. And we, in the beginning, we talked about maybe powder coating because we powder coat everything else. But the, the, the problem with powder coat is you have to grind it off when you weld it. Or if you don't, it's going to be the... Uh, it's going to create noxious fumes. So with by going to the, uh, the zinc plating, uh, you can weld it, and you don't get you don't knock yourself out with fumes. Now this is the matrix brace, and this is we actually this is actually longer than it's supposed to be. And it's simply because what we found when we started building these is there's no two chassis alike. So the whole idea is we made them a little bit longer. So that when it, for each individual application, you can just trim this down to however it fits well. Because originally we, we you know, started building these, we found that they didn't fit some cars that were too short. So then we started building them longer. But then again, you can see that, that these little brackets weld right to the, the frame rail. This is actually for a 197 because the, the back is flipped. So that's kind of our, that's our uh, uh, matrix system. So I'm going to go back to sharing, see if it works. Okay. How do I get a full screen, carry with that going to back to the beginning? No, I'll have to go to the beginning. So that's under an and under a SN95. Now this would be under the S197. What we with the S197, they actually have a frame rail that runs front to back, which negates the need for the double cross subframe connector because there is no gap between the subframes front and rear. There's already a channel there. So what we do is we just do the the jacking rail on the outside. We do the matrix brace, and then we just well, the matrix breaks right to the existing uh, 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 rail, uh, frame rail that's right in there. So it's, uh, it, and it works really good. We had one of our customers uh, decided to use only our products as he, he got this system for his S197. And he thought, well, I'll give this a try and see if it's any good. And he, he found the difference to be so significant that he's just, he's been a devotee ever since. And in fact, I think we just set him up with uh, has set his car up for track. And moving forward to the 550 cars is what we found is that underneath the, uh, the 550s, a huge difference just in the chassis itself. Uh, much, much stronger, much more rigid, and they had to because of the new suspension, the, uh, the IRS in the back and then the, the, the double arm uh, McPherson strut in the front requires a much stiffer chassis than in, in the past. So, in the way that the, the, the underside is really difficult uh, to go in and just weld along a pinch weld. So, what we did is there's, there's a couple of bolts front and rear that are really handy. And you can see what we've done is we've made access. So this bolts right to exi with existing bolts, existing bolt holes. So, it's just slick as can be uh, the bolt right up. But what's unique is the fact that these aren't tubes like everybody else, these are fabricated jacking rails. And the reason they're fabricated is because there's a five degree uh, slant on the body where this would mount to. 
So what we did is we, the bottom is perpendicular to the ground, so it's level and perpendicular to the ground. But because this, this is a, a trapezoid and not, uh, not a rectangle, we get this five degree angle in here, so it just bolts up firm to the chassis. Per bolts firm to the chassis, and then the bottom is perpendicular. Uh, it's something nobody else is doing. But we decided that this is, this is gonna be the best way to, to, for, the, for the 550 cars. And it's, it's like a 20 minute bolt on. It's a piece of cake, but sure makes a difference when jacking up the cars. So that's the only, only under chassis support we have that's a bolt on and not, uh, uh, not a weld on. For the Fox SN95s, we weld everything under the chassis uh, because if you're, if you're bolting, you're having to create holes and, <clears throat> and it's, they're not gonna last. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna wobble and, and work itself loose. And besides, you know, Ford doesn't bolt the, the, uh, the bodies together. But on the one night, but on the 550s, uh, there's already two strong points, two existing bolt holes, so they're not going to, you know, wobble or move around. It's just going to be a really nice uh, mount. So I think uh, we're going to move on to uh, stretch tower braces. Uh, a stretch tower brace, pretty interesting. Back in, in 86 in the Celine cars, I mean, we really struggled to make the 86 cars race worthy. And one of the things is we always have problems getting them to, I mean, they didn't really want to turn. I mean, they go like stink in a straight line, but stopping and turning were, the, were two big issues. So one of the solutions I came up with <clears throat> is I, made, I built a three-point strut tower brace, and we put, on, put it on, the, on both cars, the 86 cars, uh, for Road Atlanta. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the FCCA uh, tech people came up and said, well, that's not part of the production car, so you can't run it. So we, we could use it for that weekend, but we couldn't uh, use it the rest of the season. But, you know, that was kind of a clue, and it really did make a difference. So what we did on the 80, we, you know, we kind of re-engineered the whole Celine uh, streetcars over the winter between 86 and 87. So the, I got all the, all the things into the production car that I needed for the race cars. Uh, Three-point strut tower brace was part of it. Uh, Four-wheel disc brakes was another uh, five lugs, so there's a bunch of stuff that from the race program fed right into the production cars. So in 87, and that point forward, all those lean cars had a three-point strut tower brace. And uh, this this is kind of a pretty close to an example of what was originally on the the uh, 86 Celine cars. Uh, right now, I mean, the only, we, we used to have, uh, you know, quite a few strut tower braces, uh, but right now the only one we actually have uh, in production is for the 0304 Cobra. And, yeah. and again, you can see all our stuff is just really super high quality. Uh, this is our kind of signature powder coat. It's a kind of a really cool gray metallic. Uh, and you can see that we bolt that right to the stop, top of the strut tower, and then back to the firewall. And that creates, you would think that that creates one triangulation, but in reality, I gotta go back to the beginning again. In reality, it creates three triangulations. So here's the most obvious one, strut tower to strut tower, to firewall. But if you take a look, you also have, this is a triangulation here. We're triangulating, we're, we're bridging the gap between in the corner, which makes this a triangle and makes this a triangle. So we're actually putting three triangles in the front of a car. Uh, we put four triangles per side under the car and putting three triangles in front and then in the back, uh, we're putting uh, actually three triangles, if, if you look at it this way, the rear shock tower brace. So I love triangles. Now the 197s came out. Uh, this is, this was, is not a firewall. This is just thin sheet metal and it's a divider between the, the engine compartment and, and the firewall. And to me, there was no real value in, in tying into that. Uh, because it was pretty flexy. 
So we just went with a two point strut tire brace, which really had a, made a big difference. Uh, so much so, I can't remember what year, but Ford eventually started putting uh, strut tire brace, two point strut tire braces on their cars. But we were the first one to come out with this in, in 05 when the cars first came out. And we used to build these. Uh, we'll probably get them back in production someday, but this was our inner, inner skeleton, as we called it, uh, the super street cage. And this really has a huge amount of internal structure. And even though it looks like it might be a six point, in all actuality, it was an eight point. We've got the main hoop. Uh, so there's two points there. We've got the rear bars. There's two points there. We've got the front bars. There's two points there. But also, these little tabs up here, we actually bolt that to the, the seat uh, bolt, the seat belt uh, bolt in the B pillar, uh, which actually makes it more rigid. So we've got, I think, just a handful of these left. Uh, we'll probably get back in there producing these um, maybe next year. Uh, we've got a lot of things we've got to get caught up on. We just, uh, a lot of you know, just to bring into the market this new rear suspension that's kind of taken up a lot of time, but it's moving along nicely. Uh, and uh, you, I think we might be almost ready to do another little presentation for the next group of people on the, on the new uh, Kenny Brown K Link rear suspension. That's phenomenal. But we do have for the uh, S197 and 550 cars is a four point roll bar. Uh, we have a lot of our track day guys uh, are going over this there because they don't use the back seat on track. So we're doing a rear seat delete and then doing the four point roll bar. But it's handy because it has this crossbar, which is really handy to wrap seat belts around uh, for for track days. So that's kind of the uh, you know, where we've ended up with uh, on chassis. Ah, here we go. I guess Carrie put a nice little thing in here next week. Uh, I guess we're talking about IRS versus live axle and uh, for show and tell or IRS carrier mod. Well, we do. That's, it's pretty interesting. And uh, it's uh, we the only people that really cater in and uh, specialize in 9904 Cobras and the, uh, the Mustang IRS. And uh, part of the uh, part of our upgrades is we completely change all the geometry. And that's something we'll be, we'll be talking about next week. So I need to, yeah, I guess I'm back. Did I go, I guess I'm back, okay. I would take care, I was really struggling with trying to share thing today for some reason. Yep, um, shows how much you miss me. So yeah. I, I've actually figured out how to do it virtually. So we'll practice that for the next one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, cause I start to panic when I can't get things to work. And not having here is just kind of a, it's, it's 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 kind of like one hand tied behind my back or uh, but I, I'm I'm getting by, so that's kind of what we're talking. About. The whole idea of stiffening a chassis is first of all so the suspension works better. If you've got a chassis that flexes, what that ends up being is that is a fifth unwanted and unmanageable suspension component. Okay, because if if you know springs and shocks are going up and down. But if the chassis is kind of doing this thing, if it's twisting, you don't have any way to control the twist. For the oscillation of the wheel, you've got a shock to control the spring oscillation. But if the chassis is twisting, there's nothing there to control it, which is why we go to a stiffer chassis. And one of the things that, that people notice like right away, I mean, you, you put like a, the, the matrix system on, you don't have to go but 100 yards so you can feel the difference. I mean, it's that, it's that significant. But a, a little trick that's important is anytime uh, people put uh, my chassis system on, I strongly recommend that they make sure the doors are closed. If it's a convertible, top up, doors closed. But you have to support the car under, under the suspension points, not under the chassis, under the suspension points. Because you want the car to be pretty much sitting as it would on the ground. Because once you weld that stuff in place, it's there. And we've had instances where people have, have not paid attention to that. And they, you know, they put it up on a four-point hoist, welded it in, set down the ground, and the doors won't work. Well, that's because that shows you just how much the car bows. And, and, and they, what they have to do is they get them back and cut them off and re-put them on. So it's important that if you put any kind of checks and structure on underneath that you get this supported under the axle, under the front suspension arms, so that it's, it's as if it were sitting on the ground. So that's kind of the thing. And, and other, also takes away squeaks and rattles. 
uh, you know, those cars get older, they squeak and rattle. So that's, you know, the problem was that the, the Mustang, the unibody Mustangs, especially in, in the, the Fox, were really flimsy, almost like a tin can. We would actually see instances with Fox cars where guys would split the floor. I mean, actually split the floor right behind the driver's seat from the outside right over the top of the tunnel. Uh, if, if, if there's enough force to just split the floor, uh, you, you can imagine just how much those cars actually move. When we first started doing it, we could jack up, you know, like a front wheel, and the front wheel would be off the ground, and the back wheel would still be on the ground. But once we put the chassis stuff on, you jack up the front wheel, and everything moves up together. So it's really, really important. Uh, you know, that's that's my solution to you know an, a, a nagging problem on Mustangs. So I think I've got through everything. I, th I think we might be up to questions. Have we got any questions this morning, Carrie? Uh, we sure do. We have some questions, but uh, first I want to take a moment to wish everybody a happy Father's Day. This is Father's Day weekend and uh, have a great day. Uh, tomorrow we're having a brunch at our house uh, with our son and uh, grandchildren and obviously daughter-in-law. So we're going to have a nice, nice morning tomorrow and watch the F1 race. Where's the F1 race from, Kenny? Uh, France. Power, France. Power yep. The France Grand Prix. Uh, from Paul Ricard, which could be interesting. The whole Formula One season this year is really getting interesting. Uh, but also, uh, I'm I'm making my signature biscuits and gravy to go with that, and, and fresh squeezed orange juice. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a good morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Um, so we have a question here from Rory. Uh, are battle box reinforcements a must for the IRS and a Fox? Do you know what battle box is, Kenny? Nope. Okay, here's Brad's description of it, so you know. Battle box is a reinforcement assembly that welds the pickup points for the rear lower control arms where they mount to the chassis. These can sometimes crack or separate. He also adds that the much more common in drag racing as opposed to road racing. Okay. And these are uh, for Fox and SN95 cars. So again, Rory's question is, um, are battle box reinforcements a must for the IRS in a Fox? Uh, we don't do that. And the reason is, first of all, with our, with our, you'll see with our IRS mod, there's a great big mallet in the back that goes from the car IRS carrier to the, the frame rail. And it's big and clunky. It's in the way. It weighs a lot. We actually cut them off and we weld on a bracket bolts right to the frame rail which pretty much locks the, you know, the, uh, the IRS carrier in place. You don't have to do anything else at the front or anything. It just it locks it solid. And then uh, for those pickup points on the suspension, those are all reworked and reinforced. So we really haven't had any need to do anything else to it. Uh, at least, you know, but we don't do drag racing. In fact, I, I highly recommend against drag racing with an IRS car. Uh, IRS cars are not meant to drag race. They're more for road racing. There's a number of reasons, but it's just they don't make good drag cars. Back in 99 and uh, 2000, when the uh, Cobra first came out, I was I was a static seat IRS because I'd work on IRS cars back in the 70s, and I owned the form of the Fords and Formula Atlantics, but also like the Triumph, Spitfires, and, and TR6, uh, and uh, uh, Datsun uh, 240Zs. They all had IRS, so I was really familiar with it. Uh, but <clears throat> the the... the the drag race people, you know, back then were pulling the IRS out and putting live axles in, which is the correct thing to do. I mean, if you're going to go drag racing, you need a live axle because you, you actually dial in uh, anti-squat. And it's really hard to get, you know, significant anti-squat into an IRS car just, just because of the architecture uh, of the geometry. So, you know, we don't, you know, uh, we haven't had any need to uh, do any uh, battle box reinforcements. Uh, again, if it's if it's something for drag racing, then I suggest you check with somebody that does drag racing. Uh, but something we never do because we have never had a need for it. Okay, what else? Okay, so we have a so Crossfire is going to put you on the spot here. So are you ready for his question? Okay. Anything on the horizon for Fox Body Mustangs? Now, do you want to say or not? Uh, it, it's on the horizon, but it's it's a distant horizon. Uh, the answer is just I mean just. Two, two of the things I want to do, uh, it's, it's on my list, but it won't be till at least next year, uh, is going to be a, a decent rear suspension for the Fox. 
Uh, nobody's done a proper rear suspension for them ever. <clears throat> and we've got really good geometry, you know, AGS 4.0 on the, on the 197 cars. So what I really want to do is do a bolt-in four link for the Fox with the current geometry, which would just change those cars completely. Uh, and then also we want, I want to bring to market a double wishbone for the front. But we've got, got some of the prototypes that were been tested that work really, really well. Uh, just a matter of bandwidth and getting to that. So maybe a year or so off uh, is, is the best guess. But yeah, I mean, it's something I really want to do. I mean, this Fox stuff has been in my head for the last 10 years. And I just knew how popular foxes were going to be again. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 it drives me nuts. So there, I'm on the spot and I wiggled out of it. Okay, here, here we go. Yeah, Kenny can develop more products in one week than we can get out to market in one or two years. So uh, so w the co corporation is more of a holdup than him. So he's got tons of uh, product ideas and uh, things he's been working on as far as prototypes. Uh, here's another question from Crossfire. A friend of mine put a S550 IRS to his Fox body, required custom front bra uh, brackets, rear bolt, uh, bolts through the frame rails, and big rear flares. What is your opinion of a S550 versus a SVT IRS as a as a swap for foxes? Uh, personally, I, I, I'd stick with the, the SVT IRS. Uh, it's a simple bolt-in. We've got all the go-fast pieces you need to make it work. The, the thing about the, the, uh, the 550 IRS is that it packages really, really well. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's just a cool package. I mean, it's compact, but you do have a really wide rear track. The other thing is that the 550 cars have a whole bunch of nannies built in as far as stability control and a bunch of other things uh, to make the cars handle really well. What we have seen over the years is people with 550 cars, if they turn all the nanny devices off, like turn all off, the cars get really loose. And uh, most of the crashes that we've seen with 550 cars have been backed into the wall uh, because they turned all the nanny devices off, they got loose and they backed away. So what that's telling me is the core geometry is could use some help. I mean, from, from Ford's perspective, they're going to engineer uh, a rear suspension around a whole bunch of parameters and that we do it we didn't look at. I mean, they've got a ton of different things they have to they have to engineer to, where we're just looking at pure performance. So, you know, as far as ease, quick and easy, down and dirty, and we, we, can, we can both the, uh, the uh, SVT in the, uh, th thanks, Rich. We can bolt the SVT in the in the Fox just slick as we thought. We've actually modified our rear brackets. Okay, remember I said the brackets that bolt to the frame rail. Uh, well, they were originally set up for a, a SN95. However, we've since made some adjustments and added another hole so they can be bolted right onto a Fox car. So I mean, I, I would stick with the Fox. I mean, the uh, doing the the 550 is a lot of work, and then you've got you know how's it going to handle. And how's it going to work with the front suspension? So, I mean, you got to think about globally, you know, because my, my suspensions are systems, not parts. It's, there's parts in them, but they are systems. Like there's the, and one for the 197, the rear grip kit and the front grip kit and springs and shocks, only three elements. For the, the IRS, we've got, you know, four levels of IRS uh, upgrades for the back, and then we've got the, the front grip kit, and it all works together as a system. So, just doing that, you know, the 550, it's, I mean, it'd be kind of a cool project, but I, I don't know that the result would be worth the effort, especially when you can get there for a lot less hassle with the with the with the and have a, a suspension that really works well with the the SVT. Okay. So this is something you haven't spoken about for a while. Here's your next question: What is the artwork today, Kenny? Oh my gosh, I forgot. Okay, artwork today. Okay, this is. I, this is 1967 at Zamfort uh, for the, the Grand Prix. And uh, Formula is actually going to be at this very track this season again. I think uh, in a few weeks, I have to look at the schedule. But I thought because uh, Formula One is going back to Zamfort this year, and uh, that was Jimmy Clark when he introduced the new Ford V8, you know, the Cosworth V8. And uh, that went on to be the dominant engine in Formula One for a number of years. So that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, my boyhood hero, Jimmy Clark. Uh, in the uh, you know the Lotus the the uh, legendary uh, 
livery on the, on the Lotus from the one cars. So yeah, I've got a number of uh, artwork and this is, this is another one by, by Nicholas Watts. I've got, you know, quite a few uh, pieces right by him. These are all, uh, and signed by, it's, you, know, you can't really see this, but uh, I think that's the artist. I think this Dick Nelly was one of the mechanics and Keith Duckworth, uh, Keith Duckworth was uh, part of uh, Cosworth. He's the Worth in Cosworth. So it's, 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 a, it's a pretty cool piece of art, uh, one of my favorites. Okay. Here's another question. And before you, I read this, uh, this is last call for questions. Um, so I thought this was a pretty interesting question too, Kenny. I think you, you'll have fun inter answering this. The reason I mentioned the S550 is the SVT parts are getting hard to find. Any plans to produce your own IRS knuckles since Ford parts are long out of production? I have an entire Gen 1 RS on my 88 GT. Oh, you should mention that. Yeah, we we have been playing hell trying to find the rear uprights. Uh, now we have we know somebody that's building a billet rear upright, but it was designed more for uh, drifting, uh, and there's some issues using it for like for like road race cars and with our brake packages. We've actually I've actually talked with Bill at Fabrication about doing uh, our own spindle. And the thing, if we, when we do our rear upright, if we do, we're going to change the bearings. Because that right now, that's the weak point of, of the factory uh, rear, rear upright, is the fact they use a double ball bearing uh, uh, wheel bearing that's from like a, a tourist front wheel drive car, which is great for uh, fuel economy and rolling resistance, but they aren't worth a squat for performance because they flex a lot. Uh, to give you an idea, back when we were in, 2004, I think we were running a, a, a Cobra in a World Challenge, and you know we had a good, really nice big brakes in the front, and we we're trying to put big brakes in the back, and just really were struggling with pad knockback. And so one one time we took a, a spindle and we bolted it to one of the beams that held up the building, and put a bar on it, and you know, the whole thing bent. So okay, we can fix that. So we went back and we welded in some gussets to strengthen up the upright. And we went testing at Groton uh, with Ford Racing and, and some other people, and it didn't last but three laps. And then the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Rich just handed me something. He lost my, lost my train. It didn't last three laps, and all of a sudden the, the wheel and the axle and everything goes flying across the track. What had happened is that even though we stabilized the the upright, there was so much flex in the bearing, the rotor actually came all the way over and wore through the bottom of the upright to the bearing, you know, the, the lower uh, bearing, and it just popped out. So that tells you how much wobble is in those wheel bearings. Well, if we do do, uh, should, I should say when, it, it's on the list, <laughs> along with a lot of other things, when we do do an upright, it's gonna have better uh, double roller bearings. So that you put big brakes on the back. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're thinking about it, uh, you know, because we had, we've had trouble getting them too. Okay. So Kenny, can you tell me a little bit about your, your whiteboard has changed in the back and tell us a little bit about what, what are those lines on the whiteboard? I'm sure a lot of people are wondering what that's all about. Well, this, this is a hybrid version of tic-tac-toe. <laughs> uh, no, actually this is from the, uh, from the Speed Therapy Academy when we're doing tire temperatures. Uh, I use this as an example, an example. Like, but, uh, the tire temperatures like outside, middle, inside, outside, middle, inside, and then we'll like for one run, and then we'll make the 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 second set of the uh, temperatures based off of the pressure adjustment. So that's all part of my teaching uh, how to uh, work tire pressures, uh, how to work to, to use, use tire temperatures to get your pressures right, and then also adjust your suspension. And that's uh, taught in the Speed Therapy Academy. Is that correct? Yep, that's part of the Speed Therapy Academy. Okay, so we have another question here, um, but I want to say one more time, this is last call for any questions uh, before the big Father's Day uh, tomorrow. So here we go. I'll let Kenny take a drink and I'll continue to jabber along. Here we go. Uh, Kobe has a question. Do you really think that a strut tower brace is beneficial on the S197? There's lots of debate by internet experts. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna start internet experts. 
Yeah, there is. You've started something, Kobe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the, I, I keep telling people the two worst places to get information, get quality information is the paddock and the internet. Uh, the third is the guy down the street that knows everything. Uh, it, it's just, I mean, all you have to do is think about it. I mean, you've got loads coming into one uh, strut tower. And if you could just put a brace, even doesn't have to be three point, just two point side to side. If you can, if load goes into that one, having a brace on there is going to help transfer some of that load over to the other side and keep that from loading up, moving so much. So absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, uh, don't listen to internet experts. They have no idea what they're talking about for the most part. I mean, pe people, people, probably people in the internet that don't know what they don't know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it just, just makes sense. I mean, if you've got loads going into one shock tower or strut tower, uh, and it's just pushing, it's going to push it up and down. But if you had a, a brace from there over to the other one, all of a sudden they're going to be sharing the load. Uh, and that's like half the load then goes in, into each, so that car will handle better. And you get better tire wear and the line will stay better. Okay, I just yep. wanted to make a comment. We're having a lot of IRS S SN95 questions today. Uh, and uh, obviously, Kenny does a lot of S550s and S197 Mustangs. Um, but what I wanted to mention specifically to you, SN95 and um, uh, Fox Body Cars, is that uh, Kenny will be doing another IRS uh, uh, workshop. It will be a, a one-night workshop, the last of two hours. Um, so we'll be having a sign up for that. So kind of look for that. It'll be in the next couple months. We haven't specifically set a date yet, but kind of look for that. Another thing is we have our break workshop coming up. That will be this next month. Um, we're yet to set uh, the date or we change the date because uh, the Facebook rules have changed working through that process. But here is a couple more questions. Uh, they're going so fast here. Okay. Well, I, I, okay. That's, that's, that's a good piece of news. All you IRS guys that I'm doing a workshop was also a good piece of news to me because now I know I'm doing a workshop. Okay. Yeah, we get a lot of IRS. And then the S197 uh, people have been requesting a workshop too, Kenny. I think you could do a workshop every week and, and we keep you very busy. Okay, here's one from Greg. How do you know what starting cold pressures to start the day with any given uh, race slick? Okay, race, slick. race slick. Okay, race slicks are different than track tires or street tires. Uh, and it, I mean, a true race slick like a Pirelli works to an absolute pressure uh and it, it's kind of like the only way to the only way to know where <clears throat> cold starting pressures are to start where you where you left off if you're i'm, I'm going to work backwards from slicks because i'm not a fan of, of slicks on track day cars uh because really to get the best most out of the slick you need really high spring rates and really good shocks uh to give an example it's just like you know a stock mustang has a front spring rate of 130, I'm talking 197, 138 to 150, somewhere in there. Uh, our, our, our track day, uh, advanced track day cars with good track tires or 650 front spring. Uh, on my late Paul's World Challenge Mustang uh, with on Pirelli Slicks, it was 850 to 950 spring rate with uh, motorsport, you know, real race shocks. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of putting slicks on a track day car unless you've got it really set up uh, because they, I mean, there's, there's, there's a number of reasons. I'll, have to, I'll talk about that at a separate time. But okay. I'm going to start with street car tires and work back, back to the race tires. With the street tires, like on my car, I would start with around uh, 30, 32 to 34, depending on the day in the front, and then 20 to 29 rear. And then do the tire temperatures and bleed them down and get to the right, the right temperatures and pressures. And then what we do is at the very end of the day, after we spent, you know, the morning, the afternoon, getting the pressure just perfect. At the end of the day, we let everything cool down uh, and go back and check the pressures. And whatever those pressures were that evening when the tires are cool would be our cold, our new cold uh, starting pressures. So that, that's kind of like the way you have to work. Now with, with a slick, you're going to like, I, I know Pirelli is the best because I work with them the most. Uh, Pirelli wants you to run 30 to 34 pounds worth of pressure and they're an absolute with, with like a track tire or a street tire you can go around by the time you're done at the end of the day you're going to have four different pressures on four different tires because you're asking each tire to do a different job okay the left front's working the hardest 
the, the left rear, it's a, it's a clockwise track, left rear is working second, right front, and the right rear is just kind of hanging on. So you're going to get four different pressures based on which tire, you know, what each tire is doing. For slick, they, because of the construction, the sidewall construction, they work specifically to a pressure like 32 to 30 to 34. We seem to always end up right around 32, sometimes 33, but mostly 32. Uh, the only way to do that is to start higher than that and, you know, uh, go out and run hard. And when the tires feel weird, come in and bleed them down to the right pressure. But, uh, yeah, it's if, if, you, if, you're, if you're not running a really high spray rate, uh, there's potential. There's potentials for things to happen. Uh, and that's why I'm not a fan of uh, slicks on track day cars. But, uh, okay, so just to let you know that Greg has an FR500S is what he's driving. Huh. Yeah, so I, I did want to interrupt you earlier, so. Okay, well, it uh, depends on what, what uh, now the, when we ran, I ran the, uh, I engineered three cars in the Mustang Challenge, FR500S cars. And we ran the BFG uh, slicks back then. And I know that uh, we were just updating uh, updated Cliff's FR500S to 2011 World Challenge specs. Uh, those chassis suspension, he got the new rear suspension on top of it. Plus, we did the engine upgrades, and it's making like 380 rear horsepower and a 440 flywheel. So it's a pretty quick car. But he still run the BFGs. I mean, if you do go up to uh, slicks, I mean, I, I suggest a better shock than what came on them. Uh, the sack shocks are not are, are not that good. I mean, I didn't like them back then, and uh, and uh, Cliff had a bunch of problem with his. We we switched him over to the JRZ Club shocks. But if you really want to run like Pirelli's and stuff, I recommend a Motorsport shock. It's a pretty high spray rates. But I mean, if you need help with that, just you know, set up a fifteen minute consult, and we can kind of talk about. It. Okay. So and you, and you can set up a fifteen minute consult by uh, Brad. will add the link. Uh, to sign up with the consult is it's Kenny's calendar when he's available and or else you can just call in at 317-396-2768 and we'll set you up. Um, let's see. Crossfire. Here's another one from Crossfire. Here we go. If Kenny made his own IRS knuckles, literally could build his own drop in SVT base IRS without anything but aftermarket axles, could make a tubular carrier if cores dry up. So, and he says that he finds those all the time. Huh. He yeah, might yeah. have to get in touch with you. Yeah, yeah. The, actually, the carriers are are not that hard to find. It's the uh, it's the the spindles and the uh, the differentials are the tough, tough thing. Uh, but yeah, something else we talked about going forward because we're going to continue to support the IRS is actually doing our own carrier that already has the uh, the geometry. Uh, modifications already built into it. So again, that's that's on our long list of uh, new products. There's going to be at least a year away or so. But yeah, we thought about that. And then if we did that, then we might even do a different center section that's a little more robust. So you're, you're thinking like I'm thinking. Yep. And um, let's see. Oops, that's Brad's comment there. So I, again, the 15 minute is a really good way. There's not many people in industry that open up their schedule to talk one on one with you. So if you have any questions, tech questions, or want to put their build plan, Kenny's available, uh, just got, click on that link for the 15 minute. The other thing I wanted to add is um, a lot of people don't know about the Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society Facebook uh, Kenny. It's a private Facebook group uh, that Kenny interacts with, and there's a, a just a really good group of like-minded people in that. So if you're interested in that, I'm sure Brad will be putting up a link to join the Speed Therapy Society Facebook group. If you um, don't get the link, you just can look up Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society on, on Facebook, and you'll find the group. Okay, Kenny, yeah, I that, think... That's where the questions come from. I talk about on questions and subjects come through from the Speed Therapy Society. And that's also where any uh, workshop that Kenny's doing or any uh, points of interest is, is shown in there. So you'll get a uh, notification in there. Um, I think that might be it for the questions, Kenny. So a good session today. Yeah. Really enjoyed hearing about the chassis support. So yeah, it's apparently we have a lot of interest in IRS, which is, <clears throat> which is cool because like I say, we're the only people in the aftermarket 
that support it, not only support it, but actually know what we're talking about. Like I said, when, when the IRS came out in, in 99, I was happy as a clam. Everybody else in the Mustang market, when I plucked it, they just didn't know what to do. Uh, but for me, it was, it was, it was like wonderful because I worked with it so many times, so, so much in my past history, I worked with IRS that was just a piece, piece of cake. And uh, I just like the way they work. I mean, you get the geometry right in the back, the front grip kit and, and the rear geometry, like on uh, uh, Kermy, my uh, 2001 uh, track day car, which actually started out life as a V6 Mustang for SEMA that Ford wanted me to do. Uh, because like, I think it was like a problem with V8s or something back then. So they want to draw attention to V6. Anyway, we turned that into uh, Cobra with, with our, IR, our IRS in the back, our front grip kit in the front. And then it started out with a, a supercharged V6 because that's what Ford wanted. But then we switched over an association with Ford Racing back then. So actually switched it over to a prototype FR500S, no, FR500 uh, four valve uh, engine which was kind of cool thing made some really good power so okay if no more questions came in i think we can probably wrap up for today uh if any if you got questions or if there's specific subject matter you'd like me to talk about uh send it into the speed therapy society and uh, like i say that that's all, all my questions and and subjects come out of speed therapy and science and when we talk about something else and apparently uh, i'm doing a uh, uh, an irs workshop in the future so with that if nobody else then uh, i'm glad you could join me this morning uh happy father's day to all your fa all the fathers out there and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend we'll see you next week